morning or evening, wherever you are, welcome to this Shimazu sponsored webinar. I'm Nazim Butagu, Life Science Product Manager at Shimazu Scientific Instruments. I will be your moderator today and thank you for joining us. So before we start and have Kevin and Kendra take over, a couple of notes for everyone's viewing experience. The webinar console has a variety of items to help enhance your experience and interaction with us. So in the screen, in the screen sorry, you will see the following items. On the top left is the widget for questions and answers. Please submit your questions during the presentation through this widget and we will answer them during either the Q&A session or after the webinar concludes via email. Right below are the survey questions that you may fill out anytime during or after the presentation. Right across on the top right are the speaker's bio. You may expand the item here to learn more about us. In the center is the area for presentation slide and right below are the resources where we added links to application notes, videos, and brochures relevant to the topic we are covering today. Finally, there is a demo request form. It is located at the bottom right. If you are interested in seeing the instrument personally, we'll have samples to submit for evaluation. Fill it up, hit send, and we'll reach out to you as soon as possible. All right, now to know that you are a little more familiar with the viewing platform, we are pretty much ready to start. Again, if you are joining us, I'm Nazim Butagu, your moderator. Today is the second installment of a webinar series focused on multi-based imaging for the masses. In the second part, we will be discussing how the Tucker Lab evaluates the effect of environmentally relevant concentration of pharmaceutical on terrestrial environment by using the earthworm Asenia hortensis as a bioindicator of soil toxicity. They will present a very interesting combinatorial approach that includes LCMS-MS quantitation of their target pharmaceutical along with all the MSI of their model worm to look at distribution of specific target molecule. Again, we ask that you submit your question through the widget and we'll do our best to answer them at the end of the webinar during a Q&A session. We'll be starting off with the presentation from Kendra Selby and Dr. Kevin Tucker. And before we pass it over to them, and also since we already introduced Kevin in the pre-first webinar installment, I will focus on the bio of our guest speaker, Kendra Selby. So Kendra Selby received her Bachelor of Science in Chemistry with a biochemistry concentration from Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, in 2022. She is currently working toward her master's degree and plans to graduate in May 2024. She works in Dr. Kevin Tucker's analytical chemistry lab, and she focuses on the effect of pharmaceutical as environmental contaminants on the terrestrial environment. Her project encompasses a complementary approach with quantitative LCMSMS to quantify pharmaceutical uptake and qualitative MALDI MSI to visualize the distribution of the pharmaceutical sorry, and related metabolites. I had the chance to meet Kendra several times and I'm ecstatic to have her join and present in our webinar today. Okay, without further ado, I will hand it over to Kevin and Kendra. Take it from here, guys. Thank you, Nazim, for your kind introduction. I'm here with Kendra Selby and today we'll be talking about multi multimodal mass spectrometry analysis of statins effects on earthworms. And today we'll be presenting a little bit of background on mass spectrometry and method development, um, as well as a lot of data that we've uh, been able to obtain on, on this project. So I hope you'll stick around with us throughout the presentation, and also feel free to ask questions in the chat. So throughout this talk, we're going to be focused on statins as our environmental contaminant. And so to start out with, we'd like to set the, set the scene and talk about um, our environmental contaminants and then talk a little bit about the techniques that we're going to be using. And we'll also be talking about uh, our method development and how we went about uh, targeted quantitation, followed by uh, the reason why most of you are here is to hear about the mass spec imaging and where we hope to go from here 
and then recognizing the support that we've received. And so to, to start out with, I'd like to talk about setting the scene of how these contaminants are actually getting there and focusing in on some of the techniques that we're using analytically. As a general overview of what this study was all about, um, we were looking to model the exposure of terrestrial organisms um, where we use the model organism of an earthworm to environmentally relevant concentrations of a pharmaceutical, in this case statins, um, so that we could observe the changes that occur within that model organism uh, during an acute exposure event. Um, and in addition to that, we were uh, going to continue to use a protocol that we've developed uh, as far back as 2018, uh, whereby we use quantitation by LCMS, uh, followed by uh, complementary analysis of MALDI MSI, and put those two together. And so now to take us into the beginning of this and talk about uh, the, some of the background of environmentally relevant concentrations of statins and our choice of the earthworm, I'll turn it over to Kinder Selby. Thank you, Dr. Tucker and Nazim, for that kind introduction. I will get started uh, talking about my master's thesis project by discussing how pharmaceuticals are entering the environment. Um, so wastewater treatment plants and sewage treatment plants both have great difficulty in efficiently removing pharmaceutical compounds. As a result, the effluent from these facilities is entering both the terrestrial and the aquatic ecosystems while also containing the pharmaceutical compounds that are contaminating the environment. Part of the reason why pharmaceuticals and their degradation products are of such great concern is because these substances are biologically active at low concentrations. And so that is why it is of great importance to both quantify the amount of statins being taken up by terrestrial inhabitants as well as qualitatively assess how these compounds are affecting these organisms. The pharmaceuticals that we selected for this study are statins, which belong to a class of pharmaceuticals known as blood lipid lowering agents or antilipidemics. We selected atorvastatin, lovastatin, and simvastatin because they behave similarly in vivo. Lovastatin and simvastatin have extraordinarily similar structures and differ by the presence of an extra methyl group in simvastatin. And atorvastatin has a vastly different chemical structure. Statins, such as those mentioned previously, act in vivo by inhibiting the enzyme HMG-CoA reductase. This has the downstream effect of preventing the formation of what is thought of as bad cholesterol or low-density lipoproteins. In doing so, this prevents um, atherosclerosis from occurring, which can lead to adverse health effects such as chest pain, heart attack, and stroke. Earthworms were selected as the model organism for this project because they are invertebrates that are abundant, inexpensive, and easy to care for, all of which are huge advantages not only in research but especially in academia. Different species of earthworms have been used for a myriad of reasons, all of which demonstrate that their bodily systems are sensitive to environmental pollutants. Asinia fatida has been used for trace metal analysis, examining different insecticides as well as pharmaceutical compounds. As a result, this project initially aimed to use Asinia fatida as the model organism for statins in the environment. However, due to supply chain issues, we chose to move forward by using Asinia hortensis, which has been previously demonstrated to assess um, particularly different metals and other to toxic substances in the environment. Now that we've discussed the relevant background surrounding the environmentally relevant concentrations of pharmaceuticals in the environment um, being assessed through earthworms as a model organism, we will now move forward by discussing the instrumentation that is relevant to this project, including LCMSMS and MALDI MSI. Shown here are the essential building blocks for any mass spectrometer. First, the sample becomes introduced through the sample inlet. For LCMS, this is done by High Performance Liquid Chromatography, or HPLC. In the case of MALDI, this is done typically through a load lock chamber on the front of the instrument. 
after the sample is introduced to the instrument, it then enters the ion source, which, as the name implies, ionizes the sample itself. For LCMS, this is typically done through electrospray ionization, ESI, or atmospheric pressure chemical ionization, or APCI. In this case, we use ESI for our LCMS. In the case of moldy MSI, the ionization technique itself is matrix-assisted laser desorption ionization, or MALDI. The laser strikes the uh, surface that is coated with the sample and matrix, after which the ionized analytes and matrix desorb and enter the mass analyzer, which is the next component of a mass spectrometer. In the case of MALDI MSI, as we were just discussing, the mass analyzer is typically a time of flight or TOF mass analyzer, as is the case with our instrument. The mass analyzer for an LCMS can be a myriad of different things. Um, in our case, it is a triple quadrupole mass analyzer that is capable of tandem mass spectrometry. Finally, the analytes will reach the detector and a data system that connects all of the building blocks will then generate a mass spectrum based on the detector. An essential step in performing MALDI MSI is optimizing the choice of matrix. Um, as you can see here on this slide, there are a variety of different matrices to choose from that belong to several different classes. This study, as a part of the matrix optimization portion of it, used DHB, CHCA, or HCCA, as it is shown on the slide. Um, throughout the rest of the presentation, though, it will be referred to as CHCA. Cinepinic acid and DAN, or D-A-N. As an optional step, one could also wash the slides in a solution prior to applying the matrix. The washing solution or solvent to be used can take a variety of different forms, including alcohols, salt solutions, and organic solvents. The choice of wash solution or solvent that one would use would depend on the types of interfering compounds that one would want to remove. So, for example, in the case of analyzing lipids, removing things that are highly polar by using a salt solution would be advantageous. Because statins are lipid-lowering compounds, we sought to image different lipids um, by MALDI MSI. And so as a result, we did optimize the uh, salt wash that we used for this imaging experiment. Thank you, Kendra, for helping us to cover the background of both the environmental relevance of this work as well as the instrumentation and methodology. As we start to move forward, we're going to be focused on the acquisition parameters that are being used in order to perform this study. And with that, we're going to go over um, both the setup of uh, our exposures for worms as well as uh, the instrumentation details of how we're going to perform this. To start out with, we're going to point out that uh, the environmentally relevant concentrations for atorvastatin, lovastatin, and simvastatin uh, were taken from three specific citations that are listed here, and the 100% concentration is what was found in those citations. And those are 0 0.2 nanograms per milliliter, 0 0.1 nanograms per milliliter, and 1.5 nanograms per milliliter. At that point, um, 200 milliliters of solution was applied to 1.2 kilograms of soil in order to provide uh, adequate wetness uh, for um, earthworm to live in. And then we wanted to provide exposure both at environmentally accurate concentrations of 100% as well as a lower concentration of 10% and a significantly higher concentration of 1,000%. After doing each one of those, we moved on into um, what the experiment would actually entail. And each one of those tanks that we were exposing in would contain 20 different worms. With those 20 different worms that were set up in each one of the tanks, we have five worms uh, that were going to be dedicated for a non-dissection experiment. 
we have five worms that were dedicated for dissection experiments. We had two worms that were dedicated for multi imaging. We had five worms uh, that we've saved for a future metabolic study and frozen at minus 80. Um, and then we had three worms that were left over um, in case any of the worms either died or more likely uh, actually escaped or vanished from the tanks that they were being held in um, because when it rains, uh, the worms become significantly more mobile. For the worms that were either dissected or non-dissected, uh, both of those types of worms go into this workflow. Um, as you can see in the workflow, the worms starting in the upper left are frozen with liquid nitrogen and then either dissected or fully homogenized. And the dissected worm has its guts removed or its intestine removed. And you can see that in the dissected image there. Uh, where the worm is splayed open uh, with the gut appearing in the right-hand side of the picture. Following the removal of the gut, um, that worm, what's left of it, uh, is also homogenized. Uh, following homogenization, the addition of an internal standard is added in order to control for any uh, matrix effects and during extraction. And then uh, catchers is performed uh, and, and we uh, perform an extraction and remove the supernatant, drying down the supernatant. Uh, we then reconstitute in one milliliter of solvent, uh, centrifuge that again, and remove the supernatant for analysis on our Shimazu LCMS 8060NX system, where we are able to perform calibration and quantify our samples. The HPLC operating parameters for our instrument, uh, we actually are using the Shimazu Next Call uh, C18 5 micron uh, 50 by 3 millimeter column, uh, which is a short uh, but effective column uh, for this separation because our samples are relatively clean. Our mobile phases are uh, 2 millimolar methylamine. Uh, with the addition of 0.1% acetic acid. And for mobile phase A is uh, type 1 water, and mobile phase B is, of course, uh, HPLC-grade acetonitrile. Uh, we're using a flow rate of 0 0.4 milliliters per minute uh, with an oven temperature of 30 just to make sure that everything is isothermal. Our internal standards for each of these, we've purchased a deuterated uh, isotopologue for each of the individual statin species, atorvastatin, simvastatin, and lovastatin um, from uh, different, or from Cayman Chemical uh, for each one of these and are able to use those in order to provide internal calibrations. For our MSMS -MS calibration, um, and operation parameters were able to operate in a positive polarity um, with an interface temperature of 350 degrees Celsius, a DL temperature of 220, and nebulizing gas flow of 2.5, and heating gas and drying gas flow of 10 liters per minute each. The two worms that were dedicated for MALDI sample preparation um, are prepared as follows. Uh, the individual worm is curled in a fashion that it fits within a uh, aluminum bottle cap. And the aluminum bottle cap is approximately the same size as a cryostat chuck. And so the freezing of that worm within that uh, specific area makes it easier to mount uh, the worm's body onto that cryostat chuck. It also provides a uh, curling that enables us to put it onto a, uh, the MALDI imaging slide uh, that has an imaging area of 15 millimeters by 50 millimeters of imaging space. And so once it's on the uh, aluminum bottle cap, um, it is uh, liquid, frozen with liquid nitrogen and then allowed to warm to cryostat temperature. 
and sliced into a 20 micron section and the the sectioned worm is then uh, washed with an ammonium salt wash and we'll be talking about the the various anions that were used during method optimization uh, along with ammonium and then sprayed with uh, CHCA uh, before being imaged on our Shimazu Maldi 8020 system and you can also see the extracted uh, multi mass spectrum as well as our one of our extracted ion images. For our multi acquisition, uh, we followed a specific set of multi collection parameters. Uh, first, I can tell you a little bit about the multi 8020. Um, it's a linear positive polarity only multi TOF instrument uh, that incorporates a frequency tripled ND YAG solid state laser with a wavelength of 355 nanometers and a maximum frequency of 200 hertz. Uh, for our experiments, we're using a mass range of 300 to 1100 Daltons, collecting 20 shots at 100 hertz, um, and using a blanking mass of 300 with a relative laser power of 90. Um, and we use that consistent relative laser power across all of our different samples in order to provide consistent ionization rather than changing the polarity and optimizing for each individual sample as we found that to be more consistent for our individual needs. Now that we've discussed our acquisition parameters and the method development phase of this, I'd like to talk about the targeted acquisition as well as the imaging that was performed, starting first with our LCMS MS acquisition parameters and data. Our masses of interest for this are, of course, our parent mass for atorvastatin, lovastatin, and simvastatin, along with the associated masses for our deuterated isotopologs. In addition to that, we also have um, the potential of needing to observe our methylamine adducts um, based on the fact that we had methylamine in our solvent. We can talk in order to take a deeper dive into why we're observing methylamine addition with some of our statins, here we can see that some of the organic chemistry that happens between the addition of esters with those amine groups. And so what you're looking at here is the ester uh, reacting with that primary amine in the presence of heat, and that's why this is occurring only in the source and doesn't happen uh, within the liquid chromatography or within the solvent phase because it's not being exposed to sufficient heat at that point. And after the reaction, what you're getting is your secondary amine. And this results in a significant mass shift. And so here you can see the specific reaction and rearrangement of the molecule for lovastatin and see how that actually affects with that ring opening reaction. Here you can observe the chromatograms from the MRM events obtained during our, from our standards, and you can observe that atorvastatin, lovastatin, and simvastatin each produce um, different retention times and have individual peaks that match up well with their de deuterated isotopologs. Atorvastatin uh, appears with its parent compound. Lovastatin and simvastatin both appear with their methylamine reaction products uh, as predicted by the chemistry that was shown on the previous slide. The specific MRM events that were tuned for each one of those individual uh, peaks is shown here uh, with the quantitative ion peak shown in green and all of the other peaks that shown in black. Finally, for our method development here, you can see the calibration curves that were used for atorvastatin, lovastatin plus methylamine, and the simvastatin plus methylamine, along with their respective figures of merit and our square values. When we were looking at the data that we've obtained so far as we're still in the middle of this study. Uh, we've been able to process our uh, non-dissected and dissected atorvastatin exposed worms, as well as our dissected simvastatin 
controlled worms. And our control worms for both non-dissected and dissected, which have not produced any concentrations for any of the uh, drugs and are just being reported here as not detected, um, what you would notice here is that our non-dissected worms uh, are yielding lower concentrations than our dissected worms in terms of a nanogram per gram massive uh, pharmaceutical divided by the mass of the original worm. And so this is indicating that you're actually removing some of the gut as increasing the amount of mass of pharmaceutical, indicating that you actually may have some dormal absorption of that atorvastatin because the mass of your drug concentration went up. We don't yet have uh, our non-dissected data for the simvastatin at the 1,000% exposure level, um, and our lovastatin data are still in the exposure phase. As we continue to process our LCMS samples, uh, we've turned a significant amount of attention to the matrix optimization for our MALDI imaging work. And we've chosen to optimize based on these four specific parameters, tissue coverage, tissue signal, lipid signal, and the feasibility of actually using those instrument parameters. And the way that we've uh, chosen to assess these differs depending upon which one um, we're looking at. But I want to focus specifically on the signal for cholesterol in terms of the signal that we're looking for from the tissue. The lipid signal, um, we're looking at a total signal from 400 to 900 mass to charge, um, which is a little bit nonspecific. Um, but overall has proven to be a good indicator uh, quantitatively for our total lipid signal. And finally, the laser power for sufficient signal is what we've been using for our feasibility. And when the laser power gets too high, it degrades our signal to noise. And so using too high of a laser power is seen as a negative um, in terms of our work. And we've gone through several different uh, iterative steps in matrix optimization, with step one referring to our matrix choice. And so we've tested several different multi-matrix uh, by spraying them on uh, with an artist airbrush and then observing these four different parameters. We've then varied the matrix amount um, in order to look at tissue signal, lipid cover, lipid signal, and the feasibility of the instrument parameters. And finally, we started looking at whether or not a salt wash became beneficial uh, in order to enhance both the cholesterol signal as well as the lipid signal or to provide a balance between the two. Ultimately, we were also looking for uh, the possibility of observing the parent uh, pharmaceutical compounds of any of the statins or any of their degradation products. And it was always seen as a plus um, in any of this work if you actually were able to observe those pharmaceutical compounds. At this point, I'll turn it back over to Kendra so that she can describe uh, the MALDI imaging data that she's obtained from her master's thesis. The first step in matrix optimization is selecting a matrix. The four different matrices that we used for our purposes were CHCA, DAN, DHB, and cinepenic acid. As described on the previous slide by Dr. Tucker, two of the assessment parameters that we used for this step of optimization were a visual assessment of the signal generated by the matrix and the signal generated by cholesterol. We found that both CHCA and cinepenic acid had good coverage of the tissue, as shown by the matrix image, as well as good ionization of the cholesterol, as demonstrated by the cholesterol image. As for the other two matrices, DAN had excellent tissue coverage, once again demonstrated by the matrix image. However, the ionization of cholesterol was very poor. This is most likely because DAN, diaminonaphthalene, is a basic matrix, meaning that it will adopt a proton from the analyte of interest and Therefore, the analyte of interest would be better detected in negative ionization mode. 
DHB, however, it is very commonly and widely used throughout MALDI MSI. However, the sync signal for the matrix and the cholesterol in our case were indistinguishable from one another. On this slide, we have the numeric values for the signal generated by the lipid region of the mass spectrum, as well as a table representation of the information provided on the previous slide, as well as this slide. This further demonstrates that CHCA and cinnamonic acid were good matrices for ionizing cholesterol and lipid-related compounds that may be affected by exposure to statin compounds. For the second step of the matrix optimization portion of this study, we examined how much matrix should be deposited onto the slide. Previously in step one, the amount of matrix deposited onto the slide was assessed by a microscope and matrix was applied until the crystallization on the sample was homogenous. One of the most notable things that we considered here were the operation parameters of the instrument, most notably the laser power. We were asking ourselves whether or not the instrument can feasibly be operated at the laser power that we were using over time. We found that regardless of amount, CHCA operated at a relatively more fair laser power than that of cinepinic acid. So that way we are having less chance of degrading our signal to noise ratio. As we'll see on the next slide, the relatively high amount of CHCA, which would be depositing 50 milliliters of 10 milligram per milliliter onto the slide for approximately 500 milligrams being deposited onto the slide, generated the best image for lipids and related compounds. Here are the images generated by CHCA and cinnapinic acid. All of the images shown here are for cholesterol. And as I mentioned previously, the relatively high amount of CHCA demonstrated the best image operated at a more feasible laser power than that of any other image. Following optimization of the choice of matrix, as well as the amount of matrix that should be deposited onto the slide, we assess the effect of a salt wash prior to applying matrix to the tissue. We selected ammonium salts because of their favorable interactions with statins. We used ammonium with acetate, formate, bicarbonate, and sulfate. For each of these salts, we assessed a wash time of 5, 10, 30, and 60 seconds. These were all compared to a wash with millipore DI water as a control. Shown here on this slide are the 5 second salt washes with water as a control, as well as ammonium acetate, formate, bicarbonate, and sulfate. The outline of the worm, as demonstrated by the signal from cholesterol, can be seen for all of the wash conditions except for acetate. Moving on to the 10 second salt wash, the 10 second wash conditions, at this point we began to see a redistribution of cholesterol as it moved out of the tissue and into the surrounding area as especially pronounced for the water and acetate washes. Bicarbonate and sulfate both show Excellent signal for cholesterol on the earthworm tissue. However, the intensity for sulfate is visually much greater than it is for bicarbonate. As we increase the wash time yet again for a 30 second wash condition, water, ammonium bicarbonate, and ammonium sulfate all showed degraded image quality. However, for formate and acetate, visually the images appear to be better than they were for the 10 second and 5 second washes. However, we can see that the intensity for these images is quite low. Now increasing the wash time to 60 seconds, ammonium acetate and ammonium formate both demonstrate a redistribution of the cholesterol outside of the tissue of the earthworm, thereby demonstrating poor spatial quality. The signal generated by the ammonium bicarbonate wash was so low that although the outline of the worm can be mildly distinguished, it is still very low intensity. Although the sulfate is of high intensity, you can see that there are some confounding signal outside of the region of the earthworm that could interfere with the analytes of interest. 
Additionally, the water wash was not tested at this point due to the extraordinarily low quality of the 30-second water wash. It was predicted that this wash would not have improved. Shown here is a table summary for the salt wash portion of our matrix optimization study. There's a lot of information presented here, and a few things to point out are that the signal in the lipid region of the mass spectrum for some of the wash conditions was far too high, thereby degrading the signal-to-noise ratio. For example, that was seen for the 30-second bicarbonate wash. On the other hand, though, the 5-second water wash and the 10-second sulfate wash, for example, demonstrated sufficient ionization of cholesterol as well as good signal in the lipid region of the mass spectrum. We decided to proceed with the 10-second sulfate wash. The completion of the third step meant that the matrix optimization portion had been fully completed. From this study, we had determined that depositing 50 milliliters of 10 milligram per milliliter CHCA was optimal following a 10-second ammonium sulfate salt wash. The instrument was then operated at a laser power of 90, pulsed extract of 1,500, and 20 shots. Shown here are some preliminary images using the optimized matrix parameters. Here we have the statin parent compounds for atorvastatin on the far left, lovastatin in the middle, and simvastatin on the far right. Most notably with these images, we see that atorvastatin is evenly distributed throughout the body of the earthworm, whereas lovastatin and simvastatin are more localized to the gut region. Shown here is a choline head group following exposure to 1,000% concentration for atorvastatin, lovastatin, and simvastatin, respectively. There is even distribution of this choline head group throughout the body of the earthworm, regardless of exposure conditions. This makes sense given that choline head groups are ubiquitously distributed throughout most biological organisms. Shown in these images is a putatively identified lipid signal that occurred at 411 mz following exposure to either atorvastatin on the far left, lovastatin in the middle, or simvastatin on the far right. What we notice here with this lipid is that for atorvastatin, it is distributed evenly throughout the body, whereas for lovastatin and simvastatin, there is, once again, localization to the gut region, as was seen with the statin parent compound. Not all not all lipids exhibit the same localization pattern as seen here with this 522-MZ lipid. Following exposure to any of the statins, the distribution is approximately the same or not notably different upon visual assessment. Shown here is another putatively identified lipid occurring at 617-MZ. Once again, we see the same pattern as shown with the 411-MZ and the localization of the statin parent compound, where there is even distribution followed by atorvastatin exposure, as well as localization to the gut region as seen with lovastatin and simvastatin. At this point in our study, we've been able to draw several conclusions from the data that we have collected thus far. First, we have noted that lovastatin and simvastatin are acting similarly in vivo, given most likely their structural similarity to one another. Additionally, following optimization, a 10-second ammonium sulfate salt wash was found to best enhance the ionization of endogenous analytes within the tissue of the earthworm. Following exposure to these statins, lipids and different related metabolites experienced localization. However, not all analytes necessarily were localized following exposure. And perhaps most notably at this point, atorvastatin has a more generalized distribution throughout the body of the earthworm following exposure, whereas lovastatin and simvastatin appear to be more localized, which suggests different absorption patterns for the drugs that were tested here. And with that, I will now hand it back over to Dr. Tucker. Thank you, Kendra, and thank you for your excellent presentation of your thesis work uh, and for all sharing all of the great mass spectrometry images uh, with us. And we look forward to seeing the publication come out uh, when we conclude our study uh, sometime this fall.
Next up, we're going to go and take a look at what our future goals are for this work, and then I'll acknowledge uh, our support in this work. And so our next steps in this is to complete the rest of the LC MSMS uh, quantitative work and then to complete the remaining MALDI MSI images uh, for the samples that we are yet to run. Um, we'd also like to get some putative identification of imaged lipids and related metabolites by having some high resolution mass spectrometry analysis performed on some of those extraction samples. And then a comparison of lipid content uh, via MALDI MSI using a statistical package. And then finally for the uh, current study, the use of a HRMS uh, potentially for some non-target analysis and identification of lipids present in the samples uh, that we may or may not be able to see via MALDI uh, due to the limitation of it being in positive mode only. And following all of that, if you recall, we have five worms uh, frozen at minus 80 uh, for a metabolomic study and we'll be performing that with the Shimazu GCMS TQ8050 NX, and we'll be doing that uh, in the future, and hope to report back to you the results of that study as well. And with that, I'd like to thank many of the excellent undergraduate students who have taken part in this research, uh, having responsibilities from uh, dissecting the earthworms, which is a tedious task to caring for them or performing the extractions for LCMS MS. And so I'd like to thank Claire Cordy, Sidney Worth, Ashley Churcherillo, Gabe Bressendorf, Noah Hanratty, and Lauren Fan. And so thank you to all of you uh, for all of the time and energy that you've put into this. And with that we'll conclude and with that we'll conclude the presentation with acknowledgement of the support that we've received from this for this study. First, we'd like to thank Shimadzu uh, for the placement of the uh, Shimadzu MALDI 8020 uh, instrument in our lab, and we've had that instrument for uh, a little over two years while we've worked on this project and are drawing to a close uh, with our project this fall. Finally, I'd like to thank the funding agencies who have been able to make this uh, work possible, and those include uh, the EPA, the NSF, uh, the USDA, uh, the Illinois Innovation Network, uh, Sigma Xi, who has supported uh, specific researchers in my lab as both undergraduate and graduate students, uh, the Illinois Corn Marketing Board, and the Undergraduate Research and Creative Activities Fund here at Southern Illinois University Edwardsville. For completeness, here is a list of citations that weren't able to fit on slides 6, 14, and 18 in case uh, when you view the webinar in a non-live fashion you want to pause and grab any of those specific citations. Thank you, Kendra, Kevin, for making yourself available and presenting. This was truly insightful, and I know I'm going to repeat myself uh, because I said it also in the part one of this webinar, but I really believe that Shimadzu has a game changer here for my spec imaging. So, Kendra, Kevin, are you guys ready for uh, a couple of questions from our, our audience? Yes, that sounds great. And thank you again, Nazim, for the opportunity to share some of the science uh, that we've been able to perform thanks to our partnership with uh, Shimadzu. Uh, you are very welcome. It's been a pleasure really working with you all throughout, uh, you know, those two uh, two years and seeing uh, how you guys uh, started and how far you've come. Uh, it was a really, truly great accomplishment. Um, so uh, looking at the questions that were asked, you know, throughout, you know, your talk, uh, we're going to have a couple, and I'm going to have also some questions that were that that that, that I will ask you. Those are, 
you know, mind. So uh, we'll start with technical questions at the beginning, and then we're going to just get a bit more general, uh, just to highlight you guys, what you're doing, and our collaboration, etc. So, all right, um, looking at the question, okay, let, let, let's go with this one. Uh, how difficult was it for you to section uh, the worm? Uh, any any guidance you can provide uh, for good sectioning? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as far as cryo sectioning goes, I think the best quality to have is patience. Um, we mount our worms in ice. Um, it's possible that using a gelatin substance might be a bit more advantageous, but um, as a cost-saving measure, we decided to go with water and there, there's definitely a, an art to it and a finesse in the technique that just kind of need to find the niche that works out best for you. So truly, patience is really the best uh, quality to have and the best tip I could provide in terms of sectioning. Thank you, Kendra. I, I, I agree with you. I think in the early days, me trying to do uh, not warm sectioning, but uh, just a whole brain, I, I find it to be uh, you know, very difficult making sure that the brain will stick directly to uh, the slide, not have it smear in in any way, because they will show in in the uh, uh, in, in in the analysis. Um, so you're right. Uh, be patient, and then uh, I think what is it? Uh, practice makes perfect, makes better. Yeah. In this case, uh, I don't know that perfection ever happens, but practice certainly makes better. Awesome. Yeah, I agree. I agree. All right. Another question is, um, so uh, looking at slides 34 through 37, I, I, I wanted to ask you, or I mean, the listener wanted to ask if um, what was what what did you use, you know, for your evaluation? You're looking at several results several times and the distribution look a little uh, definitely different. So, you know, take us through the thought process and, you know, the goal of the optimization. Yeah, absolutely. So the goal of the optimization, um, is, I guess as the name implies, was to really just optimize our parameters. You know, what was the best matrix to choose? How much matrix should we apply to the slide? And then the point of the salt wash portion of the optimization was to really look at to see if we could enhance signal intensity while also um, suppressing any interfering ions or really removing inter any interfering ions that could be present um, that are endogenous to the worm tissue. As for the salt wash, again, specifically, um, all of the images are showing cholesterol. And the reason that we chose to look at cholesterol for this step was we expected to see cholesterol pretty ubiquitously throughout the earthworm tissue. Um, and so it just gave us really a, a common signal to assess between all of the images. That way we could get an idea of uh, which salt wash was going to be the most advantageous for our application. Very good. Uh, very good, Kendra. Okay, so um, another question. This time, this one, this time it's going to be me and maybe also Kevin can pitch in, but really this is about the user and the learning curve. Um, so how, how, how much did it take you to get comfortable, you know, on a system, the Maldi, and in a way where you can just uh, walk up to it, put your slide in, uh, find the right tuning or like the right acquisition setting and, and run an experiment successfully? Uh, yeah, so the software and the instrument itself is definitely user-friendly. Um, once we had prepared all of our samples and then really just testing different laser powers and pulse extracts and um, number of shots fired and just kind of playing around with that to see what was best for our signal, um, I would say that that took the longest part of it. Um, but then once we had figured out the best parameters, it was pretty easy to, um, you know, just get it out of vacuum, put our sample in, and press fire and go away and then be able to go do other things that need to be done. Yeah, and I think in terms of the user training, um, we've had several students that have completed work on this instrument over the two years that we've had it. 
and that's included uh, Kendra is the second graduate student who will write uh, their master's thesis uh, on this and on work based on this instrument. Um, and we've had several projects that have supported other master's theses off of this. Um, and we've had everyone from undergrads to master's students trained uh, on basic use of the instrument. And so in terms of just usability, um, simple analysis of just walking up and collecting spectra off of a single dried droplet spot is very easy to do. And adding in that imaging step doesn't require uh, that much additional training, but it is one more additional piece of software that you're dealing with, um, but still relatively user-friendly and easy to set up. Outstanding. That's uh, it, that, that that is great, and I I think you know when uh, that confirms a little bit uh, our our feel. You know when this product was developed, that it'll be a a, a great instrument to use uh, to teach MALBI in general, and with specifically also mass back imaging. And um, I, I'm I'm glad that you know we were able you know to provide you guys with the an interface that 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 will come along and that help. You know, with that, with that respect. All right. So, uh, not dwelling too much on that part. I'm looking at more questions from the audience. Um, this one, yeah. Let's look about metabolite. All right. So, it, one of our audience member asked that if you looked or thought about looking at uh, metabolites of the statins. Uh, within the worm and uh, to optimize about you know optimize the acquisition you know for them. Uh, we didn't actually look for any of the metabolites, um, especially by the Maldi uh, imaging. Um, but one of the next steps uh, that was mentioned on the future goals uh, is the metabolic study using the Shimazu GCMS TQ eighty fifty NX. And there we're using one of the Shimazu method packages to look at primary metabolites. And so rather than looking at metabolites of the, pharmaceutical, or of the pharmaceutical products, we're more interested in what the downstream biochemical effects are of what uh, is being upregulated or downregulated in terms of these primary metabolites. And so we plan to have uh, results on how we're able to quantify those or semi-quantitate those uh, using that GCMS system uh, in order to further uh, expand this data set into both a metabolic study as well as quantitative and imaging. Wow, that's, yeah, that's outstanding. I mean, the breadth of instruments that you have in your lab, um, uh, it, it's it, it's great. And I'm I'm glad it's been very very helpful. So, you know, Kevin, a question from me: Can you can you tell our audience a little bit more on how you know the collaboration with uh, Shimazu enabled you to you know build a complementary sort of set of mass spec tools that can uh, get you so many results and so many and uh, enable you to uh, study uh, so many topics, right? And so one of the uh, ways that we've been able to do this or the primary funding mechanism that we've been using is that Shimazu offers a uh, partnership with academic institutions that's called a SPARC. Um, and the SPARC program offers uh, special pricing on instrumentation, um, but is more of an agreement and partnership with institutions that provides uh, a place for Shimazu to, say, come on campus and demo an instrument with future customers. Uh, it provides the uh, university with uh, enhanced access to working with Shimazu's application scientist. It uh, has enabled us to facilitate training of our student users uh, using uh, Shimazu uh, Shimazu's help 
uh, on a more frequent basis. And so the partnership that we have with Shimazu through this Spark program has really been advantageous, not just in the acquisition of the instruments, but in utilizing them to their full potential. And so we're able to really take that uh, partnership uh, now to the next level. Uh, as this year we added in um, additional instrumentation again. Uh, our Spark partnership actually started just uh, five years ago in 2018. And so we're coming up just on our five-year anniversary of starting the partnership. Um, and already we've installed about $2.5 million worth of instrumentation in the lab in order to have LCMS, GCMS, MALDI, um, as well as other uh, complementary techniques available to us for analysis. Thank you, Kevin. Whoa, impressive. That's uh, that's quite the achievement. Um, and uh, I, I, I think you, lo you look at the result and, um, you know, specifically with this presentation, seeing like how complementary all these tools can be is, uh, is, uh, is, is great and definitely rewarding uh, for us as a, a, a manu uh, instrument manufacturer um, in, in a way where we feel like we're providing like, you know, a full solution you know, for researchers to, you know, blossom and carry on their research. So, you know, we talked about Maldi. I, I was thinking about, uh, you know, the, the LCMS part. So, uh, Kendra, did you start working on the LCMS first in the project, or did it come along, or was it by design that you guys combined it uh, together from the beginning? So it was definitely by design that we intended to do this complementary study where we could get quantitative data from the LCMS as well as qualitative data by mass spec imaging. Uh, in the Tucker lab before my time here, um, they had actually done previous uh, types of studies but hadn't been able to fully do all of the analysis themselves. Um, and so this project is one of the first in our lab where we can fully do not only all of the complementary analysis in our own lab, but, but also do what Dr. Tucker was talking about in terms of the non-target analysis on the GCMS as well. Yes, yeah, the GCMS, yeah, that's gonna be, uh, that's gonna be great. Um, uh, so uh, continuing with questions from the audience and one res with respect to the matrix choice. So uh, did you go uh, with it, in 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 terms of a screen where you had several matrices that you use and you were kind of agnostic to your target compound, you were like, I know that some matrices is better for specific compounds, but yet I still want to see if there's going to be some crossover and I can get surprised that, you know, not the one that logically uh, could be good to what this compound could be good. I don't know if you, you see what I'm talking about, but um, is it, would you... Would you advise everyone to go through like a full screen of several matrices or, hey, you know, lipids work well with a specific compound. So, um, uh, sorry, uh, 9AA or DHB works specific really well with lipids, so I'm going to stick to it. Are you going to screen or like, you know, stay with like, you know, the, you know, basically the, the non matrices for specific class of compounds? I would absolutely recommend doing a screen. Um, I don't, especially with choosing a matrix for MALDI, it's never a one size fits all. Um, and so there was actually a flow chart that Dr. Tucker had put together for one of our undergraduate courses, or maybe it was during his time at um, UIUC. Um, and it, it kind of gave you a starting point as to ma what matrices might work and what matrices might not work. Um, and so we picked several of those as a starting point and then tried to determine which one was the best for our purpose. Um, you know, initially we were seeing some good signal, for example, by cinepinic acid, which was a little unanticipated um, for some of the smaller metabolites that we were looking at initially. Um, and ultimately we decided to go with CHCA. And so it just goes to show that, um, like I mentioned before, it's never going to be a one-size-fits-all and screening beforehand is definitely worth it. And I'd like to add on that the, what makes screening so important for a lot of imaging studies is when you're imaging for multiple classes of analytes. And so 
uh, our project wasn't just looking at lipids and it wasn't just looking at pharmaceuticals and it wasn't just looking at uh, one thing. And so one of the truly powerful parts of mass spec imaging is that you don't have to a priori decide what you're going to analyze for. You can take a myriad of matrices and apply them to your tissue and say, okay, what's here that's interesting that I'm able to see using these different uh, matrices? And based on that information, go back and look at um, now what targets do I think are most interesting for me to then go and explore um, for the research. And that doesn't always end up matching what your hypothesis was of what was going to be the most interesting thing for you to be looking at uh, when you get to that stage. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Kendra. Uh, uh, great. Great answer here. Um, so, looking again to our question, probably the last one from. Uh, the audience um, questions as we are closing into uh, our hour here. Um, uh, D, yes, okay, let's, let's use uh, this one. Um, so, the question is related to uh, organisms or other plants that you have plans on imaging uh, in in the future. Uh, uh, Kevin, um, I, 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 is, are you going to just keep focusing on 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 worms? Uh, uh, anything, anything else you're looking at imaging, uh, for instance? So, in the history of the lab, we've moved from model organism to model organism, trying to find uh, uh, model organisms that are um, both cost effective. Uh, scientifically interesting, uh, make for good environmental toxicology examples, um, easy to keep alive. Um, and so we've bounced around, and uh, those things have included uh, leeches and fish and uh, microscopic organisms and beans and algae. And so we've hit from vertebrates to invertebrates to plants to microorganisms. Um, right now, we've done a lot of work in the earthworm area. Um, I'd actually like to move up the toxicological tree a little bit and find something that's neurologically a little bit more complex uh, next. Um, but earthworms remain a model organism that we're interested in for terrestrial uh, ecotoxicology. Um, but I'd also like to find something that's robust for aquatic toxicology. And so some of our next projects focus around uh, finding that next model organism that we're going to focus on for uh, aquatic toxicology. Thank you, Kevin. I, I, I do like the approach here where, you know, the cost is really taken into account and, and, and really brings in uh, – uh, the feasibility and accessibility to everyone's uh, into into any project they can they can take on right in order to and, and mimicking what you're doing so that's great all right guys so I think yeah we we close it into an hour but before we leave I I I, I wanted to um, give uh, to ha actually I have a question for Kendra I give her um, a chance actually to take to, to talk to us about her next step. So, Kendra, what's next? Um, so, in the coming weeks, I'll actually be working on uh, putting together my application for PhD programs. Um, I'm hoping to pursue a degree in analytical chemistry. Um, what lies after that, we shall see. Um, I don't want to limit myself to any one thing, but just really excited for what's to come and to learn more about various uh, mass spec imaging techniques. Awesome, awesome, Kendra. Um, you know, I think I think showing, seeing what you have have done, you know, through this presentation, uh, um, I, I, uh, I I strongly believe that you have a very very solid base in uh, 
uh, in, in mass spectrometry and uh, I, I wish you a lot, a lot of success uh, in, uh, first of all, in your applications and, you know, your, your next graduate school studies. Um, Thank you. Uh, you are welcome. All right. So looks like we're at the end of our allocated time for the webinar. Thank you for the audience. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Kendra. You're very welcome, and thank you again for providing us the opportunity to share some of our science with you. My pleasure. Since we don't have time to answer, we didn't have time to answer all the questions. Uh, for those who didn't see their questions answered and brought up, we will reach out to you individually and answer them via email. Uh, so once again, thank you all for attending. Uh, we will send you an email with a link to view a recorded version of this presentation anytime. We'll help to have you back in webinars we organize in the future. Have a great day.